reason we are here, as I suspect most of you do know, is to celebrate the reopening of a legendary Birmingham venue, which is Henry's Blues House, one of the most important venues in the history of British Blues. Uh, a hotbed of uh, nurturing of musicians and, of course, in fact, most famous for being a place where Black Sabbath came together and invented a genre of music that is still defining the way the world runs. And as far as it can try, defining the way the world turns just with face friends. So uh, I'm the front man for the Shuffle Pack under my name, Stuart Maxwell. Um, well, Stuart Maxwell. Well, I've got rid of it. And uh, I've been working with Jim for the last three or four years on various projects for Big Bear, and we're very privileged to the shuffle back to be the first band to play at the New Henry's at this excellent venue, the, the Bull's Head. Um, so we're just going to take a few moments to chat with Jim about how it all came together, a bit of the history, and what the hell he thinks he's doing trying to resurrect it 50 years on. So if you'll bear with us, then uh, we'll have a quick conversation. Does that make sense? I followed every word. You'll have to project. What was your name? I can't remember now. I got lost between the two. Oh. So, Jim, in 1968, I think some of us here remember that year. Uh, my fondest memory of that year was seeing Arthur Brown on top of the pop singing uh, Fire. Um, it was a crazy world. And there were riots around the world. There was um, the start of the Apollo Pro. Well, the, the Apollo program was in full flight, uh, preparing for the landing on the moon the next year. Um, it was a, an interesting and transitional year. Jimi Hendrix was coming to the end of the experience. Cream were in their pomp and about to blow up. It was a very interesting time, and the blues was a very interesting state, wasn't it? Absolutely. We really, really had to experience the blues. I think going back to. 1954, as far as I'm concerned, I saw Big Bill Brunsey, my mother took me to see him at Birmingham Town Hall. I don't know why she took me to see him, thank goodness she did. And then we had a bit of a gap, we didn't quite know what was going to happen next, until two guys from Frankfurt, Germany, Paul Slipman and Fritz Rau, um, organised the first of their American Folk Blues Festivals, and they were absolutely stunning. You saw Otis Spann, Sister of the Farm, Willie Waters, Chuck Berry, Cousin Joe from New Orleans, people who we happened to work with later on, but those first Little Rad tours were absolute eye-openers. And that sort of sound that I'd heard when I was 12 and 13 with Bruinsy uh, suddenly made sense. So we felt we could get involved come 68. We'd had a hit record, a small hit record, with a band I played in called Locomotive. Um, I left the band to manage them, I like to say, they think they're probably sackly, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're not here to defend themselves. So so the truth is, we'll take so the the too. and I found some of my evenings clear. Uh, I came across a band called Baker Moon Blues Line, who were fronted by a guitar player called Clem Clemson. Some people may know that name. He went on to play with Coliseum. Um, humble Pie, and today he's one of our top session blues players. Um, the blues boom, can I know him too much? Uh, well, yes, so <laughs> get us to the point, Jim. Well, you were going to just talk about the blues boom, which I think the, the, the peak of the British blues was probably, as, as most of you know, from about 64 to 67, there was John Mayall, the Yardbirds, uh, Graham Bond organisation, and of course Alexis Corner and Cyril Davis really kicked it off. And uh, there was a little band called the Rolling Stones, were quite involved in that as well. <laughs> and I think, speaking personally, what's interesting to me is that that blues boom happened at the time of Beatlemania. And everyone talks about the Beatles as kind of inventing modern music. It was the blues boom that invented modern music. Most of the, the, the heavy classic rock that uh, we got into in the 70s actually flowed from the blues, and obviously the Beatles were a massive influence. But those tours that Jim's talking about with Sonny Boy Williams and Buddy Waters were huge shifters of, of music culture in this country. But that boom had kind of happened. We had Fleetwood Mac getting into the charts, John Mayall was going to America, and the blues was beginning to sort of fade out in favour of the rock that came after it, pre Led Zeppelin, those kinds of bands. 
So to start a blues club in Birmingham in 1968 was quite a bold move. So tell us a little bit about it. Well, the blues movement, as you said, was, was dying. Every time you try to book a band out, the first question a promoter would ask you is, they're not a blues band, are they? Well, they were a blues band, but they were very, very good. So I decided to rent the upstairs room of a pub called The Crown. Right now it's at the bottom of those classic American steps behind the U Street Station. Um, and it's pretty rich, it's reputable in those days, in these days, and those days it was just as tacky as it is now. As some people the back will remember. Um, and we called, we went to the upstairs room, it cost me a pound a night, uh, unless he took more than 20 pounds at the bar, in which case I got the room for free. I never, ever had to pay for the room. Uh, the opening night I panicked, as I've done many times in my life, over promotion. I, I over promoted. We had um, blues shows, or, or rock shows, should I say, at the Odeon, our, our leaflets every night, and we had 190 people in for a room that really held 160. And there were more than 200 people outside couldn't get in, which was the very best promotion for, for a new venue. Uh, we opened with Baku Blues Line. It was the only way to put a spotlight on that band, and that's where Henry started. Then Baker Lou started moving on and gave me a chance to put other stuff. And other stuff included Big Boy Crudup, Arthur Crudup, who wrote That's All Right Now, Mama, which Elvis Presley had as his first hit. We had Sun House. Uh, bizarrely, one of the great, great, great New Orleans piano players, Champion Jack Dupree, lived in Halifax. I can't quite explain why, but he did. Well, I can throw it. He had a girl in Halifax. Um, later, he moved to Sweden, and guess what? He had a girl in Sweden, and eventually he uh, lived and died in Zurich, Switzerland, and he had a girl in Switzerland. But that put him on every three or four weeks. It was a real privilege. And the audience in those days for blues, this was a young audience, wasn't it? I mean, the, now, we, you know, all of us who grew up with the blues, I, mean, I was kind of a second generation blues fan, I came into it in the 70s, but it, we're talking about a college circuit that time, students getting into that kind of music, um, and they were being introduced to it by Jimi Hendrix and the Rolling Stones and those kinds of people, Jimmy Page, even Jeff Beck. And, with Rod Stewart, that first album, um, the, truth, the Truth album, lots of blues all over it. And they, in that, those days, the, the younger generations were digging back and finding Robert Johnson and finding someone, so they knew who these people were. And why do you think that was? Why would um, the, the blues of the, the black American in the South appeal to a white English student? Well, I guess you ask yourself that same question about why would it appeal to a. To the Rolling Stones, who actually named the name of the band is named after a Mother Daughter song. I think that the student generation, by uh, some magical reason I can't imagine, just fell for the blues. When later on we did blues tours, student venues constituted maybe 50 or 60 percent of our shows. And if ever you put the tour together quickly, you'd start calling the social sectors. And so many important people who later became important in the rock world were social secretaries at university. Right, thank you. Chris Ellis. Terry Ellis? Chris. Yes, yeah, so Chris Ellis. Yeah. And do you think there was something about Birmingham at the time as well that, that kind of became a uh, a cauldron in which this, this stew of blues and rock was fermented. Absolutely. <laughs> we didn't realise at the time that over the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, it's been fairly clear to a thinking music fan in this city that Birmingham is in fact the UK capital of rock and roll. Because we've always produced some of the greatest musicians in this country. And jumping ahead a little bit, Black Sabbath, I believe, are the most influential of all rock bands. Don't tell me the Beatles. Don't tell me Liverpool. You might say the Rolling Stones. But Sabbath didn't just influence people to copy them. They influenced a whole set of styles. I refuse to use the word genres. I'm not French. <laughs> So many different sub-styles of, of metal, of death metal, whatever, but all of them acknowledged Black Sabbath as the fountain in, and they came from Aston Birmingham. And yes, 
very, it's a very special place for musicians. Really and at that time, of course, Jimmy Page was prowling around looking for Robert Plant and John Bonham. Um, and, you know, the, the move were evolving into ELO and that kind of thing. So, so many, yeah, and Spencer Davis, so many things came out of there. So, talk a little bit. Can you remember when John Osborne and Anthony Ioni first came up those stairs and said hello? John Michael Osborne and Anthony James Ioni, yeah. Um, they were early members of Henry Bruce House. I've got a book somewhere with everybody's name in, including yours. <laughs> all, all, all listed with their addresses at the time. And Ozzy and, and, and Tony are early members. I, I got to, over the years, I got to talk, well, the months or weeks, I got to talk to them. I didn't know they had a band, then after a few weeks, I got a band, they would play intermission. They were nice kids, we got to know each other a bit by then, so sure. Um, the fee for a band in those days was five pounds. Uh, and they said, No, we don't want five pounds, we want the Henry's Blues House t shirt each. And that was their first ever fee playing for the Henry's. Um, First night they played, they were absolutely riveting. So I booked them again and again and again as intermission band. Oh, and what were they playing, Jim? Blues. Well, they were started out as a blues band. Blues. But were they already playing it a bit louder and a bit rougher than other people were? Louder, not rougher, because they were. This is not a word you normally associate with Black Sabbath, but they were very cultured. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were well rehearsed, they worked hard. Um, but they did a great show, but it was still blues rooted. There's lots of jazz in there. I don't know if it's common knowledge or not, but Tony Ioli also plays fruit in the style of jazz and soul. Um, Bill Ward's favorite drummers are Buddy Rich, Kansas City Joe Jones, and Gene Krupa. I mean, that's a pretty good pedigree for a rock and roll drummer. And well, could, could Ozzy sing the blues? I mean, he sounds like, you know, a ghost being murdered. But before that, was he, was he a good blues singer? <laughs> Pause. No one's ever going to watch this, Jim. Don't worry about it. Was he a good blues singer? He was a great singer. Yeah. Um, when I was, we spent a lot of time. Ozzy always felt insecure. He was the one. Everyone else could play. So he could say, look, look, I can play. So he knew he could play. But they used to say to Ozzy, oh, all you can do is sing, you know, it's easy to sing. Um, and he was very insecure. So I took him home and I played lots of Joe Turner and, and Jimmy Rushing and Joe, Joe Williams, all the blues guys. And his earliest recording, actually, was a Jimmy Rushing song. Even. Uh, and he sang the blues like, if you ever listen to Jimmy Rushing, which you really should do, his voice comes from down here somewhere. And Ozzy's does as well, that sort of bellow. And uh, I want to say he sang the blues well, but he had the blues bellow. That uh, really bellow from, from down the bottom there. So. I think the thing about Black Sabbath and those bands, especially uh, Zeppelin, were very blues influenced, Jeff Beck was blues influenced. They never lost that relationship with, with that um, primal music that is the blues. I mean, you, you remember from the first time. Uh, you came to Henry's Blues Club. I mean, what drew you in? Well, what was the first blues you heard? I think with Jim, it was the guys that he got over from America, you know, like mentioned Arthur Big Bob Crudder, and oh. Reverend Gary Davis, of course, was the star of the 30s, Junk and Jack Dupree, people like that. The thing with, with Jim, it wasn't just purely that sort of stuff. He was getting bands in like Thin Lizzy. You know, um, in their early days back in things like working out down at the farm and, yeah. and bands like that. Um, I started going because it was a place to go with my friends, but you know, I would hardly have missed a Tuesday night over about three years. Yeah. And it's just a, a great part of my teenage years growing up with it. So you were sort of instrumental part in, you know, one of the founding fathers of that pub rock scene that, that came along, out of which came the Thin Lizzy's. And the Dr. Feelgoods later on, people like that, who, who rose to great fame, Nine Below Zero, those sorts of people. Very, very much so. We didn't have Nine Below Zero, or we didn't have this in the state. Imagine status quo playing in a 160 capacity movie band. Yeah. Um, bands used to play for us at a lower price than we were, because it, we had an audience. 
Dude, this was great. They come early, they sit on the floor, they win the loop, they hardly even go to the loop in case they use something. Um, and also, we did other things as well. We, do you remember the ante room where we showed Lauren and Hardy? And, yeah. That wasn't conventional. But in the, in the earth, actually, I had, I'm sure I mentioned this earlier, because I used to put an organised thing called Tech City Jazz Club, which was um, University of Aston these days. Um, I ran a jazz night there. I did a jazz night. I had people like Jesse Fuller, the lone wolf, Buddy Guy, my everyone else's hero. Um, what else we have? Something else we're known for to free. Um, and that one day they called me in, the Students Union board, they said, uh, uh, We're going to stop with the jazz nights. Why? I didn't do mind. We've got to have beat nights. What's a beat night? Well, the first one is a band deal called The Beatles. What? The B E A T. The name of the Beatles is from B E A. They'll never get anywhere. <laughs> right again. <laughs> So, out of Henry's Blues House, um, Big Bear began to emerge. Is that fair to say? Was, was that your first real promotion of Henry Show? Outside of yes. the Yeah, his first promotion. Well, I had a locomotive in those days. We just had a hit. Um, I was in a, in a fist fight with EMI Parlophone about what the follow up was going to be. I wanted to follow up with a scar thing. I followed up with a hit. And I, I, mas I mastered a song called Broody the Red Nose Radio. Right really quite nice. Following <laughs> this song. But, but him, I wanted to go progressive. Mm -hmm. And I do know the word. So, Broody really the Red Nose Radio, right? they don't write them like that anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really. Uh, but so, EMI had their way because EMI are EMI. And they released um, Armageddon, which got a lot of friends, a lot of radio play. We did Top of the Pops. Uh, we didn't sell a record. Because our audience were kids who like dancing to scar. Why would they? So there I was left with this master. What do you do? So I set up a record label. So to David Betridge and either and said, What do I do? So he gave me an address for pressing plans. And that was our first big bear record. But at the same time, Henry's kept on going. Henry's had a life of its own because when Black Sabbath. Yeah. After I had Black Sabbath playing intermission, after a while they said, uh, will I manage them, which I did. Uh, I managed until I lost them, we weaved their number one album uh, with Paranoid, single Paranoid was at number two, and the original album Black Sabbath was back on the album chart at number 16. And that was a week I lost them. And at that point I thought, well, I don't see a lot of reason in finding local bands, developing them, and losing them. So then I turned to the American Blues. I still said Henry's for a while, but because of my new blues, I bring in bluesmen from um, mainly from Detroit and uh, Chicago. Um, I would have liked Slim, Wispy Smith, Posey James, Snoopy Pryor, and they all played Henry's. And I hope you all came to see them. <laughs> Who were the other characters? I mean, was there a, a regular bar person, or was there somebody on the door who was. You know, there's usually a Hitler on the door of these venues that stops you coming in if you look remotely the wrong age. Or were, were there people like that? I think Henry's secret device to keep people out was the gents' toilet. <laughs> <laughs> you had to walk up the stairs. The bend of the stairs was the gents' toilet. If you get past the stench from there and got to the door, you would earn your right of passage. Oh, Ron Watts. Yeah, Ron out front, absolutely. Yeah, great. Right. Yeah. All of these people come from Bruce Duke territory. Yeah, so I did my time in Brewers Drew for a while. Yeah. They were they were a legendary band and Ron was a legendary uh, promoter and front man in his own right. They were a standing dish there. Yeah. They were. yeah, yeah. I'm still in touch with John McCarr. Um, John McCarr was a great fan. Yeah. Um, my, my mother advised me not to work with them because I think she was she was a head mistress for many years, very nice woman, very broad in her taste, but 
She sort of thought it a little uncouth to have a four foot six inch tall polystyrene phallus. <laughs> For some reason. <laughs> <laughs> that was in Robert's <coughs> hands during the show. Never let go. No, never let go. <laughs> and tell us a bit about Henry himself. Henry was a particularly glamorous uh, Afghan hound that lived next door to where I lived. And uh, I always wanted to have a dog. And I have a blues club named after a dog. It was close to home. Yes. And there's, there's a story about a photograph of Henry that is now sort of currency among Black Sabbath fans. Did you didn't know that? Well, the hardcore Sabbath fans uh, are aware of Earth and, and uh, where they came from. And they know about Hindus. And the, the, one of the great sadnesses was that there was never a photograph of this dog who gave his name to the club and who was the logo for the club. And, and today still is. He is. Um, but, 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 yeah. Let's have a look at this. This is Henry in all his glory. The original card. Here's Henry, an original membership card from our friend here. Forgive me, I don't know your name. Chris. Chris, Chris has given us his card. An original Henry's car. Oh, there we go. Look. Technology, and that's that's the Henry illustration. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, and after many years, I learned um, an Australian Black Sabbath fan has unearthed uh, a picture of the original Afghan hound, and it's now in circulation among Sabbath fans, and it's a bit of a collector's item. So, and um, so. Were you there? But well, I mean, being a Sabbath fan myself, I'm curious to know. You know, here you are booking a blues band in a blues venue. And did they just turn up one night, and all of a sudden it was, and he was what? You know, and did you go? I mean, did you consider then throwing them out on the band? What happened? How did that evolve? Well, some of the name Earth, which they were. And they all love the name Earth, and I hated it. So I did diligent research one week on Melody Maker, and I found not one, but two London-based bands called Earth. Yeah. And that eventually persuaded the Sabs to relinquish the name Earth. We came with a whole bunch, of, whole bunch of names. We didn't like any of them. And I must digress slightly. It's to dine in the world Sabbath fans, it might be hard to believe, you may want to cover your ears, but every Wednesday morning when they worked on the road, we'd have a band meeting. At 10 o'clock, in my house, with an agenda and meeting notes, we all work on meeting notes. So, uh, it's not, they were always biting their heads off grizzly bears or <laughs> whatever. Um, and Ge Giza turned up one day, one meeting day late, and they put their head around the door, in my dining room, and said, uh, got it chaps. Oh, what is it this time? It's uh, it said, Black Sabbath. And there's a 30 second pause, and we all in unison, as if we'd been rehearsing, said, yes. And at that moment, Tony started talking about the, the, the Devil's Chord. Yes. Yeah. Which, which is the opening thing for the song Black Sabbath. He said, we should use that. So they all went away, and they woodshed it, and they worked it up. And that was a like a severe right turn for them. Well, so, was it, so did the name inspire the change of the record? They were still playing <coughs> absolutely clean Luke. blues. It wasn't that they were already writing songs with occult influence, lyrics and that kind of thing. The songs they recorded up till then were a song called The Rebel. I never knew who wrote that, but it's a great lyric. Um, my heart, your heart lies with the rebel you love the underdog. It's a great <coughs> song from Canadian rock band. I never found out who did it. They recorded High Heel Sneakers, it's Tommy Tucker, isn't it? <laughs> they recorded a song for Jim, which was a Tony playing a really incredible Django Reinhardt, sorry, sorry, totally wrong, bang, Charlie Christian guitar. Yeah. Uh, nothing approaching anything was satanic. It was the one, well, the two words, Black Sabbath, turned on their head. And this was the name of a movie, I think, that shows yes. the picture house over the road from Peter's play. The Boris Karloff film. Yeah. yeah. And things from there just went and went and went. I must say, it's hard to imagine these days, but they work really hard. They start rehearsing at 10 o'clock in the morning, till 3 or 4 in the afternoon, without any chemical assistance. Yeah, but you don't get that good. I mean, all of these bands that get 
um, slated as lunatics and irresponsible and crazy can play. There is, I think that for me, that, that was the difference between what happened, that, that uprising of youthful energy that happened in the late 60s through to the, through the early 70s. And then the, what happened in punk was kind of an undoing of all that because it just became rough. And, and, and although it was influential, it wasn't sustainable. In the way, and I think the threads of, of, of that classic rock still run through. And certainly, as you say, the threads of Sabbath, because I go and see metal bands now, and all of them will drop their caps to Black Sabbath, as well as recognising that their, their industry, the metal industry, would not exist. That's right. Were it not for Black Sabbath. Three weeks ago on a Saturday, uh, not 200 yards from here, I went to the unveiling of a bench dedicated to Black Sabbath with rather bad characters, each of the four of them. Uh, Just the character hosted it. Sorry, I only turned up, but people were sure he would, but he did. Uh, there were 470 fans there on a Saturday morning paying £12 to watch a bloody bench dedicated. <laughs> <laughs> now, that says something about Black Sabbath. All, my, my snobby jazz friends, they say, oh, what do you see in that silly rock band Black Sabbath? I say, that's my question. You have never listened to them. <coughs> Just, I mean, is there a better intro to any rock record ever than the intro to the first track on the first album, album called Black Sabbath, a song called Black Sabbath? It's a killer. Any rhythm team you ever heard tighter than, 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 than Dylan and Geezer? Do you know how they got good? They worked hard. And I booked them into places which... Here's a fact, you probably won't believe it's true. I booked them into Star Club Hamburg, which is where the Beatles developed. They played four, four nights a week, eight till two, 45 minutes on, 15 off. On Friday and Saturday, they did eight sets of 45 and 15 off, which were killing. They came back destroyed. By the time they'd slept it off, and went out to do two 45 minute sets in England, it was a stroll in the park. And that showed all the way through. You want to get a tight band? Work the mothers here. Well, I think the other thing is that it's worth remembering is what a debt we owe to the Star Club in Hamburg because so many great, great musicians made their dues there. And, you know, out of that flows the, the rock music that we all love today. So I think that kind of brings us to the end. So tell us now about the new Henry's very quickly, how you've set it up, what the deal is here, why you've chosen the Bull's Head. Squeeze it into 30 seconds. Right. Why I chose the bullet head is obviously anybody who walks around and looks around this place. It's it's made for it. It's, it speaks of music. And upstairs, it, it's wonderful. Um, Big Bear Records is 50 years old. At the moment, we decided to do a few momentous things to uh, celebrate our 50th. Most of them fell by the wayside, or at least they're on the pen- in the pending tray. But we decided to open this. We talked to Harry Higgs, who runs the place wonderfully, I might say. And uh, everything I said to him, he just said yes. So that's why we're here. Every Tuesday. From now on, in Birmingham, once again, Tuesdays is Blues Days. And no, I just tell you, next week, we've got Brooks Williams. Do you know Brooks? I haven't met him. He's uh, listed by Rolling Stones as number 175 in their list of 1,000 best ever acoustic guitar players. He plays Piedmont Blues, he comes to States for Georgia, and he's bloody fantastic. Well, thank you, Jim. And thank you very much for keeping the blues alive all this time. You've kept it alive almost as long as you've been alive, which is... <laughs> Credit to both it and you, I think. So, have to be first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>